In a previous video, we handled a mechanics problem of this nature. We had a cart that's accelerating with a constant acceleration and a pendulum swinging from below it, and we studied exactly what the mechanics of that pendulum motion was. To handle a problem that's a bit more complicated than your average Newton's Law problem, we employed Lagrangian mechanics. The Lagrangian was this, and the equations of motion worked out to be this. And then we used this equation of motion to calculate the equilibrium angle, or rather the tangent of it. Now there's a number of things to notice about this problem. The first thing to notice is that we only have one equation of motion and one degree of freedom, despite the fact that we've got two objects moving. And that's because the acceleration of the block was a priori specified, so that leaves us with only one degree of freedom, this pendulum angle here, and therefore only one equation of motion. The next thing to notice is what this equilibrium angle equation shows us. Normally, for a pendulum, the equilibrium angle would just be zero, but it's shifted off of that by this non-zero acceleration. Basically, it in effect shifts the direction of gravity, which is pretty intuitive. The last thing to notice is that the Lagrangian has no symmetries, and therefore there's no possibility for conservation laws. First of all, we see it's dependent on theta, so there's no way for there to be invariance there that could lead to a symmetry. Now you might say, well, there's translational invariance. The Lagrangian doesn't depend on the location of the block, but that's actually not a degree of freedom we have to work with because we've already specified that motion. So there's really no obvious invariance here. Now in most Lagrangians you will still have time translation invariance that would lead to energy conservation. That's sort of the most common symmetry conservation law pair, but here because we've got the block accelerating with constant acceleration, the Lagrangian is explicitly time dependent, so we don't even have energy conservation. Particularly the first and the third facts become more interesting when we compare it to similar but slightly changed systems. In another video, I handled this system. We see that the block no longer has pre-specified acceleration, but it's still not free to move however it wants. It's tied to this spring here, which connects to the origin, which then doesn't move. So we've got a pendulum swinging from a spring-charged block. You can imagine that there will be some kind of coupling between the motion of the two. It'll be pretty complicated. And again, because of that complexity, I found it easiest to use Lagrangian mechanics to handle the problem. Working through the normal procedure, we got this Lagrangian and these equations of motion. Now let's take a look at this and see what we can learn. The motion of the cart is not predetermined this time, so the system has that extra degree of freedom, and those two degrees of freedom causes us to have two equations of motion instead of one, so that's the first change from the first system. The only symmetry in this Lagrangian is time translation invariance. We can see that it depends on both x and theta, so we don't have any opportunities there. Of course, that does mean we have more than we did with the first Lagrangian as far as symmetries. And of course, energy conservation is implied here. So we've got a new symmetry, a new conserved quantity, and we have one more degree of freedom leading to one additional equation of motion. Now the subject of this video is yet another permutation of this problem. The change from the last one is that we've simply eliminated this spring, so now this block is free to move. We've got still two degrees of freedom, so we'll still expect two equations of motion. However, there is a change that's actually consequential induced by the loss of the spring, and that is now, just intuitive looking at this diagram, we expect block location translation invariance. There's clearly no physical difference between the block being located at one point on the x-axis and being located at another. All the points are the same now that the spring is gone. So let's see what we end up finding. As with the last two cases, we're going to handle this problem with Lagrangian mechanics. So the first step is to write out the Lagrangian. To do that, we need the kinetic energy of the system. The kinetic energy of the block is quite straightforward to write out because it only engages in linear motion. The kinetic energy of the pendulum is a little bit more complicated. We start with the expression in terms of the linear components of motion, and then we use trigonometry, which I've written out on this diagram here, to express that 
that kinetic energy in terms of the generalized coordinates that we selected using a little bit of algebra including our Pythagorean trig identity to simplify it down we get to this result which means our total kinetic energy is simply the sum of those two the potential energy is a good deal simpler than that it's simply the gravitational potential energy of the pendulum where you need to remember to add this minus sign out front because we have taken the positive y-axis to point down it's then straightforward to express that in terms of the generalized coordinates via the substitutions that we've already sorted out. Then if we take t minus v, we get the Lagrangian we're looking for, which is this right here. And we can see it's not dependent on x, so we've got that extra symmetry that we were expecting beyond time translation and variance leading to energy conservation. We'll see the resulting conserved quantity come out when we calculate the equations of motion, at which point we can figure out exactly which quantity it is that's being conserved by that invariance. Calculating the equations of motion is straightforward. We take the usual partial derivatives of the Lagrangian and then insert those values into the Euler-Lagrange equations, and we see we do in fact have a conserved quantity coming out of the fact that the Lagrangian doesn't depend on x. Now, it might not be obvious that the conserved quantity actually is the linear momentum. Maybe it is if you think that's intuitive. Some people find it intuitive, and some people are just familiar with Noether's theorem. However, if you don't find it obvious that this is the linear momentum, you're not out of luck. It's actually pretty easy to show. If we multiply out this term, refactor, and then extract this derivative, we see this capital X quantity, the X coordinate of the pendulum showing up. Then if we insert that and rewrite the time derivative as a dot, we find what clearly is the momentum of the block plus the momentum of the pendulum, specifically in the x direction for both cases. Now, this might be kind of intuitive to you if you really think about it, and it's certainly already known to you if you've learned about Noether's theorem, but at the very least, you can see how it can be rewritten such that this quantity that we've identified as conserved is clearly just the linear momentum. Now we can look at the equation of motion for the angles. It doesn't give us another conserved quantity, but that's not surprising. We only saw one invariance beyond time translation, so we went into this expecting only one conserved quantity beyond energy. Hopefully this video on comparing these three closely related mechanics problems helps give you a better understanding of how various changes to the Lagrangian can affect the physics implied by the resulting equations of motion. Thanks for watching.